I'm going to um, touch on a couple of points, but first I'm going to show you my full splendor, and then I'm going to get comfortable. <laughs> This is the uh, uniform of an officer of the British Army from about 1810 until about 1830 uh, with what we affectionately call the shark fin coming in and out of fashion during that period. Uh, technically, I should have been wearing a shako like the one on the table over there, and I usually do, in fact. This is more for show than anything else. It's handy because the French called a chapeau bras for that reason. You don't have to wear it at all. <laughs> the tunic is laced in gold because I am an officer. The facings, collar and cuffs are blue because I'm an officer of a royal regiment. Various other regiments have various other color facings. Red, yellow, white, green, purple. A couple that we have rude names for. <laughs> Gosling Green is usually interpreted as goose something green. <laughs> I'm going to take it off in a moment, as I say. Uh, you'll notice that the lace is in pairs. There are ten buttons on every uniform. Sometimes it came in threes, sometimes it came singly, sometimes the ends were squared, sometimes they were arranged in a bastion. And on an ordinary soldier's coat, this lace was white worsted with a colored thread through it. And the 110 regiments of the British Army each had a slightly different pattern of thread, button arrangement, and so on. So, uh, for those of you who are into things like cars, and you can identify 60 cars by their taillight patterns, you can appreciate that learning all of the intricacies of uniforms and so on can be quite, uh, quite exacting, but interesting if your mind works that way. My wife was commenting on how shiny my breastplate is tonight. I didn't work away with, uh, with a cloth and a handful of wood ash to get it like this. That was what my Batman would have done in the old days, but I've cheated. I've had it guilt. <laughs> and as I say, I'm going to get comfortable now because it is a bit warm in here. The makes, sword. Who makes your apparel? Uh, a gentleman in Orangeville, uh, Peter Twist, who's a historical consultant, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean is one of the movies he's worked on, although one he's terribly proud of. <laughs> were they really dressed like that, those zombie pirates? Yes, they were. Uh, a lot of us make a lot of our own kit. I've made all my own leather kit, barring the boots. Uh, the original uniform, which I'll show you in a moment, is all my own work as well. Um, there's a small core of tailors and, and so on out there. We're keeping a couple of old uh, old trades alive. I think if it weren't for reenacting, there wouldn't be anyone making wooden buckets in North America, for example. Because who needs a wooden bucket when you can get a plastic one? <laughs> the sword and the sash are in fact symbols of rank as much as anything else. A soldier would carry a bayonet and use it. An officer would carry a sword and probably never use it wasn't his job to get his hands dirty, it was his job to inspire the man. From the front, of course. And you can see that this is not a very practical outfit for doing anything in. <laughs> so, I'm going to get rid of it. Now, I understand uh, that you uh, have heard a little bit about the causes of the War of 1812, uh, one of our sillier wars, if I may say so. <laughs> so I thought I'd just touch very briefly on uh, how it affects at Simcoe County, both directly and indirectly, and then go on and talk briefly about the life of a British soldier. Please do stop me with questions. Uh, as they come up, I, I have a tendency to assume things that people don't necessarily know. Uh, I'm going to apologize before I hand these out, but I've made some, for the quality of the reproductions, I've made some maps here for those of you who are visual learners because it does become significant at one point. So if you'd like to take one as they pass around, I'm not sure I have one for everybody, but I think there are 20 here. And 
I apologize for the water. I'm a little dry these days. As I'm sure Bert has told you on many occasions, most of Simcoe County was not settled until after the War of 1812, but there are several sites here connected directly with the war. Uh, in no particular order, the Oro Black Settlement, uh, Wasaga Beach and Nancy Island, St. Joseph's Island up in Georgian Bay, which isn't really in Simcoe County, Discovery Harbor in Penetanguishene, and Fort Willow, just outside of Barrie. At the beginning of the War of 1812, a man called Richard Pierpoint, also known as Captain Dick, a former slave and a veteran of the American Revolution, he served with Butler's Rangers, asked the governor for permission to form a corps of colored men, as they were referred to in those days, to defend, help defend Upper Canada from the Americans. Uh, the governor and the legislature thought that was a fairly good idea. They gave him permission and promptly turned around and handed command of that corps to a white businessman, militia officer named John Runchie. So Runchie's colored corps was formed in 1812. They fought at the Battle of Queenston Heights and the Battle of Lundy's Lane. In the latter part of the war, they were used as laborers. Uh, they were sometimes referred to as the Corps of Artificers. So these would be men who were masons and carpenters and so on, not simply strong backs. They helped build Fort Mississauga at the mouth of the Niagara River and so on. After the war, as was common, land grants were given and the men in that regiment who applied for and received land grants got them mostly in Oro Township. They settled up there in the 18 late 18, 18 teens, <laughs> early 1820s. Uh, it wasn't good farmland and as was common with, with soldiers, not all of them had been farmers before they enlisted. Uh, the colony continued with greater and lesser success until I believe about the 1870s. The uh, relic of it that we have now, other than the written records, uh, is the church just north of Barrie on the, uh, the road to Aurelia. <coughs> Uh, Captain Pierpoint, Richard Pierpoint, spent the rest of his life until the 1840s traveling from place to place. He spent some time in Oro, he spent some time in a, an area called the Queen's Bush west of Shelburne, which was also an area of black settlement. His last request to the government was that he be sent home to his native Ghana, but that wasn't that wasn't done, and he passed away in the 1840s. There have been several very good biographies written up, including one by an author from Orangeville, if you are interested in looking at it. Working backwards again, um, St. Joseph's Island in Upper Georgian Bay was a small garrison of British troops, and they stayed up there till the 1820s when they withdrew to Discovery Harbor. Discovery Harbor was founded in 1815 and became a base for the surveyors and cartographers who mapped the Great Lakes. It was also at least potentially a naval establishment uh, guarding the back door to Upper Canada. And I'll come back to that thought in a minute. So there were a couple of small armed vessels there in the 1820s and 30s. The Tecumseh and the Bee, which are still up there now, although neither of them is sailing, are replicas of those vessels. Um, at the mouth of the Nottawasaga River, what's now called Wasaga Beach, was an establishment also started in 1815 and it seems to have gone out of existence about 1821. It was called Schooner Town and it was a very small landing place, stopping place, watering place for some of the British naval and uh, provincial marine units on the lakes. <coughs> Finally, uh, connected to Tunada Wasaga is Fort Willow or Willow Creek Depot. And what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tonight is the regiment, my regiment, the Royal Newfoundland Fencible Infantry, who built Willow Creek. And to do that, I'm going to start by describing what it was like to be a British soldier. In 1805, the regiment was raised in Newfoundland as fencible infantry. That meant they were a professional regiment, full-time soldiers, but could not be sent on foreign service. They couldn't be sent to the West Indies, which was a death trap in those days. They couldn't be sent to Europe or India. They could, however, be sent to anywhere in North America. 
and in 1810 they were sent to Quebec where they garrisoned the city there until the outbreak of, of the war in 1812. In 1805 and up until 1809, enlistment in both the Royal Navy and the British Army was for life. And there was no period of enlistment. You enlisted until the Army was done with you or you died. In the Navy, they had two notations next to a pay roll. One was DD, which stood for discharged dead. And generally that meant over the side with a round shot sewed into canvas with you, and the other one was R for run. The Navy didn't even, didn't even take volunteers for lifetime service. They also pressed men, kidnapped men, for lifetime service. It was a form of legal conscription and one of the causes of the War of 1812 because they were taking sailors off of American ships. <laughs> Desertion was a huge problem in both the Navy and the Army, and in fact, after the War of 1812, the British government formed a regiment of long-serving loyal NCOs whose sole purpose was to stop British soldiers from crossing the border into the United States because they couldn't be pursued and they were free. The, uh, the Noofs then would have joined up for a bounty of five guineas, about five and a half pounds, which was the equivalent of several years' wages. That was enough to get some of the dumb farm boys to sign up. Back in England and Ireland, about a quarter of the British Army were Irish, almost entirely Irish Catholics, and they joined because they were poor. The uh, fellows who joined in Newfoundland Newfoundland at that time was a fishing colony and everyone was supposed to go back to England when the, uh, when the season ended. Instead, 700 of them were recruited into the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. So they got a five pound bonus for enlisting. They uh, got a few free, free drinks on the recruiting sergeant. When they got back to the base, they discovered that they owed the army four and a half of their five pounds to pay for their first uniform. They were paid 12 pence a day, a shilling a day of which some was recruited, was uh, withdrawn to cover their food, some was withdrawn to cover the cost of their uniforms, some was, was withdrawn for the Chelsea Pensioners Hospital in England, which by the way, they weren't qualified to go to. And they most, mostly have wound up with three or four pennies a day, enough for a couple of pints of beer and a pipe of tobacco, assuming they were single and hadn't lost any kit, which was also charged against them. In the course of learning to be soldiers, they would have discovered that there was one method of discipline in the army, and that was brutality. Uh, sergeants thought nothing of striking the men. They all carried swagger sticks and used them fairly vigorously. In the Navy, it was a rope's end, and they re referred to it as a starter. It got you moving a little quicker. Um, up to a hundred lashes was quite a common punishment for minor infringements, being drunk on parade, uh, being absent without leave, having a dirty uniform. For serious offenses, such as mutiny, striking an officer, or desertion, uh, unfortunately, Parliament had restricted lashes to a thousand. They capped it at a thousand in about 1780. Uh, the variation that the Royal Navy used for particularly heinous crimes was called flogging through the fleet. You were triced up to a grating in a boat and rowed around to every ship in the fleet and flogged in front, of, in front of the sailors of that ship. That was essentially a death sentence. A lot of the sentences got commuted, uh, that is to say, the, because there was always a surgeon present for the flogging. And of course they flogged your back because flogging your arms and legs would render you unfit for service. It's not clear whether those those, uh, those lashes were eventually laid on later or not, the records don't seem to say, but they were smart enough to know that killing soldiers wasn't usually a good idea. On the other hand, there were soldiers, uh, what we refer to as the King's Hard Bargains, who were proud of the fact that they survived several thousand lashes over the course of their career. One regiment were known as the Steelbacks, and another the Bleeders. And that was, what they, that was what they were proud of, the tough guys. Training took up to one year, about three weeks to learn how to fire the musket, and the rest of the time to learn to march properly. If you've seen the movies, and you've seen them standing shoulder to shoulder, and the first reaction is, what a stupid way to fight a war. <laughs> you have to understand that, although the musket ball weighed an ounce, 
and was the size of your thumb, it had an effective range of about 50 yards. And what that means is at 50 yards I could hit this building almost every time I aimed at it. The orders for firing the musket were make ready, cock your musket, present, lower your musket, and fire. Aim was not one of the orders. Because they were so inaccurate, the object of the exercise was to get a mass of fire. So they fired in volleys, and if you can imagine, I know it's a frightening thought, if you can imagine 50 of me standing literally shoulder to shoulder, and another 50 behind us, we would only cover about 30 yards. So that would be 100 musket balls going down the field every time we fired. We could do that four times a minute. So we didn't have to be very accurate. The American Revolution, the British Army lost a lot of officers to a con Kentucky rifleman who could, you know, as they would say, choose which, which eye of the squirrel to shoot out. Uh -huh. But it took them almost 60 seconds to reload. So one of them shot our officer, a hundred of us shot at him three times while he was reloading. <laughs> Usually worked out even. Because of the necessity to be so formal, so straight, it took a year to train an officer, sorry, not an officer, it took, a, it took a year to train a soldier to march properly in command. And it essentially meant four to six hours a day of doing it until you marched as an automaton. You could do it in your sleep. You did it in your sleep. And you could do it while people around you were screaming and bleeding and so on and so forth. Otherwise, it didn't work. It was a very ponderous machine, but it was designed to do one thing, to deliver massive firepower over and over and over again. And it did that. <coughs> I think I'm going to step out of the, the lecture mode here and do a bit of show and tell because I'm proud of the fact that I can still still fire a musket even though I haven't done it for a few years as sergeant major. Just to give you some idea. Cartridge box with 60 rounds of cartridge, waxed paper tubes with a musket ball and black powder. Would there be earplugs in there? Nope. <laughs> Very good question. It's rather loud. The, lad, the lads at the forts wear earplugs, workers' compensation being what it is. That's the musket ball. Nasty piece. What caliber is that? 75. Three quarters of an inch. And here he carries 45 maybe. It doesn't look near as impressive when you see a 75. <laughs> Okay, I haven't done this in a while, but <laughs> got a second. Somebody got a second hand? Can I watch? Oh, I'm not gonna fire. <laughs> so if I was standing on parade, the order would be shoulder fire locks. It's always carried like that. If you were a soldier, sergeants carried them the other way, which is much more comfortable because sergeants were special. <laughs> to fire, open the pan, handle the cartridge, I would pull out the cartridge, bite, spit, kids love doing that when you <laughs> Prime, a little bit of powder in the pan, down, around, rest of the powder in here, ball goes on top, ram it out, ram it down. Return ramrod, full cock, fire. You can just see the spark, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. The half cock that I had the musket on while I was loading it was the safety. So something which goes off half cocked. <laughs> if I haven't been maintaining my musket properly, the borehole that connects the pan to the inside of the gun gets blocked up and when I fire I just get a little poof or a flash in the pan. Yes. Something that doesn't amount to anything. Nobody uses ramrod straight anymore but that used to be a common expression. When the RV wanted muskets they went to the Tower of London they took out a thousand barrels they took out a thousand locks and they sent them out to private contractors to have stocks put on them. So that lock, stock, and barrel made That's a complete right. musket.
The bayonet was triangular, which means you couldn't stitch the wound it made. The only way to do it was to cauterize it. Other armies charged screaming. The British Army advanced at the walk, and it was a very stately march. And on the command, charge bayonets, <laughs> and kept walking. And believe me, I've been on the receiving end of that, and even when you know they don't mean it, it's very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if you can imagine it going on amid a hail of, of uh, it's about the only thing that's good about the movie, but if you ever watch the movie uh, Jean Lafitte, the, uh, the scene where the Highlanders are coming through the mist at the Battle of New Orleans, and the only sound they're making other than the pipes playing is the sergeants shouting, close up, close on the middle. And every time a man is hit, the line closes. And it gets shorter and shorter, but it's an unbroken line. And it's very intimidating. They almost never had to bayonet anyone. <laughs> the military day started at 3 or 4 a.m., depending on the weather, the season of the year, with breakfast the bread you left over from your supper the night before, and perhaps a cup of cold tea. Uh, somebody took the water bucket, sorry, the night soil bucket, out the back and dumped it, and brought it in filled with water so you could wash your hands and face. <laughs> they stopped doing that in 1826 and had an immediate drop in the incidence of eye disease among the soldiers, which was quite unanticipated, but quite nice. <laughs> You would make your bed, you would wash your face, you would put on your tunic. If it was a Wednesday or a Saturday, you would be expected to have shaved. And that's what shaving meant, twice a week. In, in pioneer days, for most farmers, it would have been once a week. Uh, you might be expected to show your kit to your sergeant. When the news started the war, they were wearing white woolen trousers, I'm sorry. Uh, those aren't trousers, are they? No. Britches. <laughs> and white wool stockings. And long woolen gaiters. And if you were a bit of a dandy, you would soak your long wool. You would get your friends to, to, to recut the gaiters so they fit as close as you could. And then soak them in, in hot water so that they would mold to your leg when they, when they dried. Uh, yes, gentlemen padded their calves in those days if they didn't have good enough looking legs. Because breeches and stockings were still what were worn for formal occasions. So the noose went to war in those, the beginning of the war. By the end of the war, they had taken their white coveralls, which were what were put on for dirty jobs, digging ditches, cutting wood, and so on, with their white fatigue jacket. <laughs> There's a method to this man. It's, and they had, they had taken these as their ordinary wear to wear over their breeches. And of course, it didn't take very long for someone to figure out that if you were wearing the trousers, coveralls anyway, they couldn't tell if you were wearing the breeches. So why don't we just discontinue breech issue? And with those, they would wear short gaiters. And the reason for the gaiters is that they did not wear boots, they wore shoes. And I'm actually going to pass these around because I'm not sure you can appreciate the details. These are buckled shoes. Uh, because I was a sergeant, these are polished and shiny. They would normally have been made rough side out, rough side of leather out. And you would rub a mix of grease and blacking into them until they gleam. More to the point, until they were waterproof. And they're hobnailed on the bottom. People hear about hobnail boots, but you don't often see them anymore. Any guesses on why white? For fatigue? Nope. Nope. Isn't that why they wore colors? Why they're firing so they can see each other? Yes, it was. Yes. No, this was for digging ditches and chopping wood. No, the answer is very simple. Dye cost money. Uh, oh. Even in those days, the army had everything done by the lowest bidder. Uh, okay, so, but you'll notice it still has the facing colors because we are, after all, proud of our regiments. And my fatigue cap has my regimental number on it as well. And this is very nice because 
If I do have a couple of pennies to go into town, I put them in there because there are no pockets in my uniform trousers. Shirts were simply sewn out of linen. Oddly enough, in those days, cotton was, cotton was a luxurious, luxury cloth and linen was not. It's made out of a series of rectangles sewed together, so you don't have to be much of a tailor to do one of these. And it all went into a pack sack that looked like this. Now the irony was, getting all this in here is a lot more complicated than it would be for, he, for me to march from here to Fort Willow. Because it's designed to be worn, not carried, or worn and carried in the pack sack. I also had my canteen, which is a small wooden barrel. And would want to hope be full of water. The single commonest cause of soldiers getting punished was drunkenness. And the second commonest cause was stealing things or selling things to pay for liquor. <laughs> A good officer would learn to turn his eyes away and hope that his men wouldn't trade too many cartridges because in Spain and Portugal they were often trading cartridges to the locals for wine, which was cheap. Over here it might have been to the natives or the local villagers. Uh, as I say, good soldiers wouldn't trade away all of them. They would have enough to fight with. So good officers just turned a blind eye to some of that sort of thing. This sergeant has a deck of cards. The only difference between theirs and ours is that there are no numbers on them, so I tell the kids it's nice to play cards with somebody who's not as smart as you or <laughs> not as sober as you. <laughs> These were legal because it was a tax paid on them. People have heard about the Stamp Act, which caused the American Revolution. Well, what that meant was that things like deeds, any legal document, and so on, had a notary's stamp and that you paid for. It wasn't a postage stamp. A package of cards came with a stamp on the outside to indicate that the tax had been paid on it. That was what the Stamp Act was about. I used to have a pair of dice made out of musket balls, hammered square. Those were illegal because, of course, that was the government, the king's property that you were defacing. Someone asked about the red. Did it Hide the color of blood? No, it does not. I have to cut myself a few times, and as you can see, it's not the color of blood. It's not even the color of the officer's uniform. This is a brick red. The officer's uniform is a scarlet. The sergeant would have worn a sash, and again, it's got the facing color of the regiment, and this is, a, again, a mark of rank. Uh, that went out of fashion. That went out of fashion in the First World War when the enemy was taught to aim at the guys carrying the sticks instead of the rifles. If you look at our troops in action today, you can't pick the officer out from the rest of the troops in a patrol because that's just suicide. Now you can see that there are ten buttons here, and they were arranged singly, not in doubles the way mine were. But because I was a sergeant, I'm missing a little colored thread. It's also made of wool, lined with wool, perfect for summer in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> perfect for summer in India. One of the battles in the 1840s, they lost 250 men to seek gunnery and 650 men fatalities to heat. Yes. Yeah. People who designed these weren't the people who wore them. No. The wool is what's called fold, it's been boiled, so it's so dense that it doesn't unravel. And in fact, it's practically bulletproof. <laughs> About the only thing the army got right was the great coats. Again, fold wool with a series of, with a cape acted just like a shingle roof. Water will actually bead on this. Mm -hmm. I can stand in the pouring rain for six or eight hours before it soaks through. Mm -hmm. Then I smell like a sheepdog for three days. <laughs> 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 
And because it was designed mostly for standing sentry go in, it's too hot to do anything in. If I wear this uniform, for example, at Penetanguishing in January, I'll have to take the great coat off if I'm doing anything more strenuous than standing. Which brings us back to the Newfoundland Regiment. After they learned to drill and fire their muskets, they were shipped to Nova Scotia. When they were shipped to Quebec in 1810, they were very lucky because their women were sent with them. The regulation was that there were six women per hundred men allowed in the regiment. That's how many the regiment would feed. When a Brit British regiment left England, the women drew lots. And the ones left on the dock were effectively widowed. Their husbands who were illiterate were going somewhere for 10 or 20 years, many times to a place where the death rate was 50% a year among the men who went. So the women had the choice of walking back to their home parish and hoping the workhouse would take them in or going in prostitution. If a wife went with her husband and he was killed, she might have as little as 72 hours to remarry. She got half rations, children got quarter rations. Married quarters was a blanket draped across one corner of the barracks. It wasn't until the 1830s that they actually introduced separate accommodations for married soldiers. As I said, the day started at 5 or 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 in the winter, 4 in the summer. They would drill, do other work, uh, until about noon. The main meal at noon was salt pork or salt beef, hardtack biscuit, peas and small beer, which was about a 2% beer, just enough uh, alcohol to kill the bugs. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, in peacetime in the afternoon, the soldiers were free until tattoo. If they had a skill, if they were tailors, cobblers, masons, they might go into town and work for somebody to make extra money. The women would do uh, nursing or cooking or sewing for the officers. The officers came from the money classes, they bought their commissions, about a third of them were still buying their commissions by the time of the War of 1812, which means they brought their luxuries with them. Duke of Wellington had his foxhound shipped out to Portugal for the winters when there wasn't any fighting going on. And uh, they were a different breed. Their job was to lead the men, uh, but they really were a different species and many of them thought of the private soldiers as a different species as well. So, that was the soldier in the British Army. In September of 1813, the American fleet on Lake Erie defeated and captured the entire British fleet on Lake Erie and cut off um, any way for the British to communicate with the Northwest. Michelinackinac, if you look at your little maps, was the extreme Northwest corner of the British Empire at that point. And it was also the connection to the interior, which was vital for the fur trade and for our alliances with our native allies. So in February of 1814, 200 picked men of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment left Kingston with 20 artillerymen and 20 men of the uh, Provincial Marine, probably carpenters and ship fitters. They marched to York. And of course, in those days, Highway 2 would have been a clearing through the trees with the stumps cut off low enough so that the wagon wheels wouldn't, uh, wouldn't catch on them. They marched up Young Street, crossed Lake Simcoe on the ice to Kempenfeld Bay. They marched nine miles into the woods, widening the portage as they went to a place called Willow Creek Depot or Fort Willow. Then at a place called Glengarry Landing, they built 29 bateaus large boats. By the way, it's called Glengarry Landing because of the 250 men in the party. One of them was from the Glengarry Light Infantry. He was the commander. <laughs> we of the Newfoundland Regiment are planning on doing about something about that, some dark night. <laughs> Changing the sign. They took the bateaus down Willow Creek and down the Nodosaga River, which was still frozen. They had to break the ice and pull them down part of the way rode them through the ice across Georgian Bay to Michelomackinac, which is up by the Sioux. They bought 29 tons of supplies with them. They lost one boat, but not a, t not a pound of the supplies, and none of the men involved in the trip. They garrisoned Michelomackinac till the end of the war, and the fact that they were sitting up there 
had a significant effect on American tactics. In fact, one of the officers from the Newfoundland Regiment, Captain Andrew Bulger, went another 500 miles south uh, and was actually sitting on the headwaters of the Mississippi River, north of St. Louis, threatening the Americans when the war ended. So that was the uh, that was the significance of the Newfoundlanders' famous march. And if you read anything about the War of 1812, that one comes up over and over. Uh, I have a certain vested interest in promoting it because I'm the uh, the chair of the Friends of Historic Fort Willow. Some of you probably know where it is. It's just out, it's in Grenfell, just outside of Barrie. It's uh, not a Wasaga Conservation Authority runs it as a, a conservation area, and we have some uh, some signage and some some. Uh, reproductions of the historic buildings there. We're just in the process of building a pavilion so that we can do educational programming, we hope. Um, that's pretty much the end of my, my uh, prepared remarks. I figure it better to be too short than too long, and uh, I'm certainly welcome questions, either about anything I've said or anything I've forgotten to mention. There's a lot of things still on the table. There are a lot of things still on the table. I love show and tell. That's correct. Uh, one of my uh, one of my colleagues, when I started, insisted that they just wore their tunics all winter because they weren't issued great coats for the first winter of the war. And I said they weren't issued great coats, but they had blankets, and they were living with French voyageurs who wore blanket coats called capots. But yeah, in fact, this is all they had. Um, in Spain, in Spain, Wellington wouldn't let them carry tents because you needed wagons. So they slept on the ground in their coats. Mm -hmm. And it's not Canada cold, but they do talk about the sentries going around in the morning and peeling people off the ground. Oh, there wasn't a lot of fighting done in the winter time just because travel was so difficult. In the winter of 1812-13, there was one campaign where the British went down into Ohio. But other than that, both sides retreated to winter quarters when, they, when the roads became impassable. Uh, among the things that every soldier was given, you know, I have a pay book here, it lists trousers, boots, socks, stock, pair of braces, knapsack, shoe brushes, cloth brush, button brush, etc., etc., shaving cream, and a razor. This isn't quite period accurate, the original ones are a little shorter and a little thicker. And a shaving brush, of course. A wrench for taking apart or adjusting the musket. And a tool, this is for brushing out the pan. And remember I mentioned if the touch hole gets plugged, you mm -hmm. can't fire. That's called the cricker. It's for clearing the touch hole and it's brass. You don't want to be striking spikes, sparks. Uh, horn spoon. It's interesting, if you go back to the 1700s, forks have two tines. By the time you get to the 1800s, they have three tines. And by the time you get to 1850, they have four tines. Oh. Presumably because they're more efficient that way. Yeah. Uh, the spoon was actually made by taking a piece of, of uh, cow, uh, cow horn and soaking it in hot water and then pressing it into that shape. Mm. Uh, I have scissors and a little... Uh, little case of needles and so on, soldiers would be expected to repair minor, minor uh, rents and tears in their uniforms. Each soldier would carry a pair of half soles and a pair of heels so that anybody in the regiment who was a cobbler could repair shoes for them. They were responsible for cleaning their own muskets and so on. Um, I mentioned the cards, bottle of oil, um, Nasty habit, tobacco, but it was very common. It was one of the few luxuries that they could afford. This is what was called a church warden. We originally start with a stem above like that. What you did in the, in the taverns was you uh, essentially rented the pipe. You bought a pipe full of tobacco, you smoked it, you handed it back to the tavern keeper, and he might or might not snap a little bit off the end. Uh, and then the pipe would get shorter and shorter and shorter down to about here where it's too hot to smoke. And any 
in tavern old building anywhere in England and even some of them around Toronto you can dig up hundreds of these because they were just thrown out the back door. As you can see, they break easily too. They're actually made of clay, and oddly enough, they were three for a penny in that time. I will tell you what this one cost me all the way from Holland. Uh. Yeah, gambling would have been uh, gambling would have been one way of passing the time um, when they were in garrison. Some of the soldiers probably had uh, gardens and so on. As I say, some of them would have exercised their their uh, their civilian skills. There were a lot of tailors in the army. I suspect that that was one of those professions where as soon as the uh, economy got bad, people stopped buying new clothes and so these guys would join up. So if you go through the lists of what they did before the war and cobblers were quite valued. The um, new uniforms were supposed to be issued every Christmas day, a new tunic. Uh, often that didn't happen out here, so instead the uh, regimental tailors would take off all the uh, all the bits, turn the whole tunic inside out, put it back together again, charge you two cents for the privilege. Happy Happy Christmas from the king. Uh, actually, we know that they shipped the tunics out here in barrels, and they were just tacked together to make sure that there were enough sets of sleeves and so on and so forth and then they'd be properly sewn together out here. We also know that uh, government corruption was not, a, was not unheard of. The standard uh, shipment was supposed to be 20 large, 60 mediums, and 20 smalls, and it was off the 40 smalls and 10 larges, so they would actually have to cut tunics up and put pieces in here and so on. If you look at clothes from this period, you'll often find lining has seven different small pieces of cloth in it just to use up the scraps. So it was a terrible life. As I say, the, uh, the men were supposed to be uh, kept in for life. Uh, in 1810, they actually shortened it to a seven-year enlistment because they were having so much time, so much trouble getting people. They'd been fighting the French for 20 years at that point. The nukes served till 1816. By the end of it, there were only 100 of them fit for service, and they disbanded the regiment. Most of them were given land grants in Nova Scotia, a few in Upper Canada. Again, that sounds very generous. Keep in mind that the 100 acres didn't cost the government a thing. Shipping them back to England did. Was dental hygiene ever mentioned as a difficulty? Uh, yes, it was. Actually, recruiting, you had to have at least a thumb and a forefinger on your right hand to hold a cartridge and at least two teeth that met to bite it open. Oh, wow. it, it, was, it was a reasonably common cause of people being invalided out. It's not usually described that way, but essentially when they couldn't eat the army rations anymore, they'd leave the army. So was there somebody there that would deal with abscess teeth? Yes, uh, they had something called uh, a duck's foot. It had a hook on this side and a hook on this, two hooks on this side, and a T-handle. And you just put it over the tooth and went crank. There was also a market in good teeth. Um, they were beginning to make artificial teeth for people in England, for the upper classes, and they were made with, with real teeth put into a primitive uh, form of rubber called gutta percha. And yeah. many soldiers, in fact, after the Battle of Waterloo for 50 years, false teeth were referred to as Waterloo teeth because you could buy, you could, you could sell good strong teeth. But toothbrushing wasn't known. And uh, at one point, they were actually threatening to, uh, to find surgeons who were letting guys into the army who didn't have any teeth. They were supposed to pass a physical, but generally speaking, the doctor was only half sober. And <laughs> the sergeants didn't want anybody turned away because they got a bounty. But yeah, that would have been a serious issue. A lot of them would have had bad teeth. Uh -huh. yes. um, your regiment that you represent went to um, throughout Simcoe County. Now, would you, where would the orders come from? Would you be given a time, space, and how would it mesh with anything else in the war? It didn't vary. Okay. Um, people make a lot of the fact that the peace treaty was signed on Christmas Eve, 1814, and the Battle of New Orleans was fought in January, 1815. That was common. And in fact, no, they didn't fight after the war was over. The war wasn't over until the message got over here, which was about March. Yeah. Yes, no, uh, I mean, the, the British took Michelinackinac at the beginning of the war because they put a guy in a canoe with a double team of paddlers from Montreal, paddled up the Michelinackinac, took 20 soldiers, 
drag a cannon up to the top of the hill and then knocked on the door of Michelinakinac and said to the American commander, we're at war, by the way, you're surrounded, would you like to surrender? <laughs> and they captured it because he didn't know there was a war on <laughs> at, Fort, at Fort Niagara in Lewiston, New York, they were, uh, the officers were across the river at Fort George having dinner. And they heard of the war and, and, and the messenger came in and the American officers went to leave. And, no, no. They were also all Masons. So they finished their dinner, drank a toast to His Most Britannic Majesty George III, a toast to uh, President James Madison, and then they, they rode back across the river, and next morning started shooting at each other. <laughs> it was a different war in the sense that, that well, it may be true of many wars, they didn't tend to take it personally. Yeah. Other questions? Did the British have any rifles, or were they all muskets? They had two experimental units that were rifle corps. One of them, they actually had five or six battalions, the 60th Rifles, but they had decided, rightly or not, that swapping accuracy for speed wasn't worth it. In the American Revolution, there was an officer named Ferguson who'd come up with a really good rifle, but he got killed halfway through the war. And his... On the other hand, the British had Colonel Shrapnel, who invented the exploding cannonballs. They, they, they were ahead in the arms race in that respect. But no, rifles were... Well, who would have made the British rifles? Uh, actually, no, no, they were made, uh, they were called, they were made uh, by uh, British armories. They were, they were based on a German pattern. They were called Brunswick rifle, but they were made in, they were made in Britain. They were not heard of, they just weren't used for the army. Were there still some around? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're little squat things. They don't look like much, but uh, the rifle regiments who did use them, some of you may have seen the TV movie Sharps, they were very good. Riflemen were usually sent out to harass the enemy, see if they could pot a few of his officers and so on, and then they would retreat, retreat back on the, on the regular soldiers because they simply couldn't load and fire fast enough to protect themselves from musketry. Yes? Um, I'm afraid this might be stupid, but I'm going to ask it uh, when you were showing us loading the gun, yeah. uh, it took quite a while, didn't it? Yes, it did. By the time you're ready to shoot, whatever you're shooting at, my... Uh, well, were you shooting, if you were shooting at the enemy, you'd be pretty close. And 50 to 70 yards. To get yes, that's right. Too, but that's right. How did the timing affect you? Well, the difference was that because the British were the only army who trained their men with live ammunition, they didn't just go bang, they actually did it. They could reliably fire four times a minute. Uh, most units, most armies, twice a minute. So effectively, it was as if they had twice as many soldiers. But you're right, who fired first was, was, was often crucial. Uh, there's a famous story from one, an earlier war in the 1760s in which a member of the French Guard took off his hat, flourished it, and said, Tirez premier, monsieur les Anglais. The English proceeded to blow him out of his boots. <laughs> <laughs> Chivalrous, but not very smart. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they didn't. <clears throat> they didn't breed for intelligence in those days in the British upper class. Some people would argue they still don't. Pretty scary. Yeah, oh, it, well, in fact, that was the corrupt, that was the whole point of, of the eleven months of training was that you could stand there. I mean, you essentially took a bunch of men and turned them into a machine. So even though the guy beside you was literally coughing his lungs out, you kept loading and firing. The fact that your sergeant was walking up and down behind you was also significant. <laughs> if you're in a foxhole and you decide to duck down and not shoot, probably no one will notice. In the first, Second World War, the British or the Americans discovered that 20% of their men never fired a shot. They sensibly went into the bottom. But if you're literally touching the man on either side, you can't begin to retreat. And if you can, there's a sergeant right behind you, and you're a lot more frightened of him than you are of some apocryphal enemy. Okay. I've always been amazed that they could get off four shots in a minute mm -hmm. because the atmosphere at the time was chaos. Yeah. I mean, here you have black powder smoke yeah. swirling around. The guy next to you is missing his arm, mm -hmm. and there's noise mm -hmm. all over the place, and you're going to load that. I defy you to load that. Standing here now four times a minute. Yeah. 
and they're right in the midst of it. You know? Well, there's there's a there's a scene in, in one of the movies of, in a movie about the first black regiment, and there's a guy, and he say he thinks he's pretty good, and the officer says, "Okay, start loading and firing," and yeah. the officer stands behind him and starts firing his revolver off in the guy's ear. <laughs> yeah, but again, that's what that's what the drill was about. I mean, I became a sergeant 15 years ago. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't marched in the line and fired a musket even as a reenactor in 10 years. But I found out that if I was just standing in the rear row firing, I could be balancing my checkbook in my head and still doing it. <laughs> it just became so ingrained, you know, your pulse matched the marching pace after a while. Mm -hmm. You became a, a cog in a machine. And we haven't even discussed the presence of the Indian. <laughs> he, he's, He's out there, man. We had, we had them on our side. I, I don't know if you know, but uh, one of the ways that, that Brock won, uh, took, the, took Detroit from the enemy, first of all, General Hall was, was 76 and he had his family with him. Uh, but basically, Brock sent a letter and saying, I have a number of native warriors here and I can't guarantee their conduct if they come in over the wall. You need to understand that the rules of war in those days were uh, defended positions were offered a chance to surrender, but if they were taken by storm, all bets were off. That was because the storming party generally took hideous casualties getting in through the wall, and that was it. You'd had your chance to surrender, and after that, if you were fair game, it was that was when the war got very ugly. But yes, the natives had a huge psychological effect uh, on the British for the in favor of the British, particularly in this war. Yeah. Did they have any medical uh, uh, people who would... They had... Uh, shot in the arm or whatever it was? Yes, oh yes, there were, there were medical officers. It was a medical corps and they were called surgeons. It's interesting, British surgeons today are referred to as Mr., not Doctor, which is a form of reverse snobbery. But in those days, they were referred to as Mr. because they weren't doctors. Some of them were butchers. Some of them were self-trained. Yeah. Um, and if you looked at a medical kit, I first time I looked at one, I thought, gee, you could build a really nice coffee table with that. It's chisels, hammers, drills, saws, not much that we'd recognize. Um, keep in mind, too, that a 75 caliber slug, I mean, they didn't just whack your arm off because they couldn't do anything else. That would, that would reduce every bone in your arm to, you know, you'd have a bag of bones there. Uh, a good surgeon could take a leg off in under two minutes, and that would mean that the, that the patient might not die of shock on the table. And after that, your odds were about 50-50 yeah. of surviving. Yeah. But there were guys who walked around with musket balls in their bodies for 60 years, too, because they didn't do digging for those. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the, you know, before battle prayers was, please, please God, spare me from the surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who made your shoes? Let's get past her up. Oh, um, there's a fellow in Guelph who makes those. Um, full time. Uh, we're fairly small up here as a hobby, but there are probably two million Americans who reenact the Civil War. So he actually has a full-time business making 18th century shoes. I've made a few pairs because cobbling's my hobby, but not those. He uses machinery, though, and that's cheap. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much again for your attention.